I'm Hazima Mozam and I welcome you to another exciting lecture under Comstock Distinguished Scholar Speaker Series. Uh, we are very pleased and delighted to have Professor Dr. Keka Wusprank with us. Professor Dr. Keka Wusprank is an Associate Dean of Research, Graduate Studies and Global Affairs. He's Professor of Medicinal Chemistry and Pharmacology at Tubman University, United States, America. Uh, today, the title of his uh, talk is Cyclic Peptides, Anti-Cancer Drug Delivery. And with this, I would like to uh, thank our speaker as well as invite a request Professor Dr. Iqbal Chaudhary, Coordinator General Comstec and Director ICCPS to introduce and welcome our guest speaker for today. Over to you, sir. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and lots of uh, regions and different age group of participants among a very crowded uh, seminar room. And uh, we're extremely uh, pleased and fortunate to have a very distinguished speaker today. Comstack being an organization responsible of science and technology cooperation within the 57 OIC member state uh, is uh, responsible of many activities and we have taken uh, several initiatives. One of uh, the initiatives in the context of reduced mobility is to uh, reach out to very distinguished scholars all across the world and request them to engage themselves into this extremely exciting exercise of uh, presenting the best of what science and technology offers. So this particular series of lecture is dedicated to only the best in the world in various fields. And we are very fortunate to have a very distinguished scholar today, who is also happens to be a very dear friend and a long time research collaborator. Uh, we have had the honor of meeting each other at different places. Professor Prang is an Associate Dean of Research, Innovation and Global Affairs and a full Professor of Medicinal Chemistry and Pharmacology at the Chapman School of Pharmacy in Irvine, California. He earned uh, his Doctor of Pharmacy from Tehran University uh, of uh, Iran. Uh, Tehran University, as you know, is a very prestigious institution. And from then, he received his PhD in medicinal chemistry from the Faculty of Pharmacy at the University of Alberta in 1997, followed by a postdoctoral study in the field of solid phase organic synthesis in the Department of Chemistry. He pursued additional uh, postdoctoral studies at Rockefeller University, New York, uh, and then moved on to Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, uh, focusing on bioorganic chemistry. He joined the University of Rhode Island in October 2000 and soon became full professor. He served as uh, the program coordinator of, of Rhode Island Idea Network for Biomedical Research, a very prestigious initiative which was uh, sponsored by National Institute of Health. And he was responsible of leading this major program between 2012 and 2013. He then uh, joined Chapman University to establish the School of Pharmacy. Dr. Prang research uh, can be described as applying synthetic organic chemistry, the skills of uh, synthetic organic chemistry to solving problems in biology. His specific areas currently under investigation include using peptides as cell penetrating molecular transporters in drug de delivery, designing protein kinase inhibitors, developing multifunctional antiviral, anti-cancer and antibacterial agents, and designing peptide nanomaterial for nanomedicine. So you can see that he is actually covering a whole range of uh, uh, pharmaceutical sciences and medicinal chemistry. One major area currently under investigation is to design peptide nanomaterial for uh, application and drug de delivery, which is uh, certainly a uh, cutting edge. The objective of his, uh, this project is to design and evaluate peptide nanomaterial as cell penetrating nuclear targeting agents or molecular transporters or bioactive cell impermeable compounds. Study will document the uh, potential for new hybrid peptide 
drug uh, samples that may be used for non-covalent or covalent targeted delivery of bioactive compounds. So certainly an area of extreme uh, importance. He has also over 210 research papers, 13 pending uh, patents. Uh, he has already had successfully filed, uh, obtained 10 patents and more than 180 uh, meeting abstracts. So he's certainly one of those scientists who has not only uh, worked at the level of establishing good quality education institution, contributed in high quality teaching, but also pursued a very high quality research. With this uh, multifaceted contribution, Professor Parang is certainly among the world leaders in the field of medicinal chemistry. And it is indeed an honor for me to introduce an expert and a dear friend today in this very important workshop series. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, Dr. Chaudhary. It's great to see you. Thank you for extensive uh, introduction. Um, and I also appreciate your invitation. And uh, I'm very delighted to present today. Uh, with that, let me share my screen with you so we can get started. Uh, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So uh, today I'm going to talk about cyclic peptide uh, and uh, the application as the uh, anti-cancer drug delivery agent. So for those of you from different area uh, of the world, uh, I'm located at Chapman University in the Southern California and uh, Whenever you are visiting uh, Orange County and uh, Southern California, please let me know. I'd be delighted to be your host. So let me go to some information that many of you are aware of. So as you know, cancer is the leading cause of death. Uh, and uh, if you imagine for COVID-19, uh, we had about, uh, uh, so far we have about 188 million people infected and only 4 million people dead. Uh, so we're talking about 2% uh, uh, fatal uh, uh, pandemic. In terms of cancer, we have 19.3 million people uh, had cancer in 2020 and 9.9 uh, million dead. So we're talking about uh, around 51% dead. So, uh, and as you know, this is a very uh, uh, complicated disease and uh, it's uh, involved in different organs. This year, uh, breast cancer surpassed the lung cancer as a uh, uh, number of the cases. Uh, around 2.3 million, a little bit more than lung cancer, 2.1 million. And in, still we have mortality rate for lung cancer is much higher than all other cancer. And this is continue to be a major problem in, uh, in the world. Uh, so uh, if we don't call it a silent pandemic, you know, a lot of attention to COVID-19, but cancer is continue to be a major issue uh, uh, for many people. And as we all know, we have family, friend, uh, and uh, uh, relative who uh, have lost uh, uh, their life in cancer. In terms of treatment, as you are all aware, uh, we have a major treatment is uh, chemotherapy, but there are many other uh, ways to uh, treat cancer, including surgery, radiation, and uh, targeted therapy is a new area that has been developed and also immunotherapy. And many of these approaches are used uh, uh, in combination. So we don't have one optimal uh, way to treat cancer. And sometimes we have to use uh, even combination of multiple drug in chemotherapy. We don't usually use uh, one single drug, or we have to use different strategy like radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and surgery at the same time. So 
still uh, chemotherapy continue to be the major uh, strategy to destroy cancer cells. It can be used uh, as the only treatment option at the beginning, but also it can be used to shrink the tumor before radiation and or it can be used uh, uh, after radiation and surgery to get rid of all the remaining uh, tumor tissue and tumor cells. It can be used for recurrent cancer and metastatic cancer. So chemotherapy is still one of the major strategy that we use for cancer. And I'm sure all of you know the major problem with chemotherapeutic drugs are the selectivity and the occurrence of the side effect in the patient because many of these drugs are cytotoxic drugs and also affect the normal cell in the body. So in terms of drug delivery agent, there are many different drug delivery agents uh, have been developed and we're talking about liposome, that these are uh, a spray called a phospholipid bilayer, and you can have a hydrophobic and hydrophilic drug loaded in liposome. The major problem with the liposome is that they have uh, limited stability and uh, they cause leakage. So there are also a lot of polymer has been developed, like polylactic acid, glycolic acid, uh, PLGA is one of them that uh, can be used uh, for uh, uh, application for drug delivery. Another problem with this kind of compound is they are degraded and generate acid in the body and uh, cause uh, uh, acidic environment. And sometimes acidic environment is desirable for cancer cells. Uh, and also solid lipid nanoparticle are more preferred compared to liposome and polylactic acid. So you can have a lipid nanoparticle, you can load the anti-cancer drug inside the lipid nanoparticle. The major problem with solid nanoparticle is they have a very low loading of the compound. So another application that strategy that has been recently uh, uh, considered it's self-penetrating peptides. Self-penetrating peptides are kind of peptides uh, that they can pass the cell membrane. And peptide, as you know, there are compounds that are composed of different type of amino acid. And uh, we have 20 different natural amino acid and we have many, many more unnatural amino acid. So if you want to, uh, divide cell penetrating peptide, there are different category. We can have a, a cationic, hydrophobic, and amphipathic uh, based on the physical chemical property. Also in terms of the structure, uh, we can have linear uh, cell penetrating peptide or cyclic cell penetrating peptide. So I'm going to talk about the uh, differential uh, uh, advantage of these two. Also, they can be derived from the protein, they can be synthetic, or they can be a mixture of uh, synthetic and natural uh, at the same time. But in general, uh, uh, they can have multiple applications for drug delivery. If you look at the extracellular part of the cell and intracellular cancer cells, you know, we can have a cell penetrating peptide or CPP alone and be used for drug delivery. They can be part of the nanoparticle for drug delivery. They can be used for delivery of nucleic acid like sRNA, or they can be part of the liposome and polymers at the same time uh, for drug delivery. They can be conjugated with uh, radioactive uh, nuclide uh, for imaging, and they can be used as a cargo for delivery of other peptides. Uh, so there is multiple application for cell penetrating peptide uh, that has been uh, reported in the literature. But in in terms of the linear cell penetrating peptide, these are very short uh, number of amino acid. Uh, uh, we're talking about uh, 60 to 20 uh, amino acid. And 
they have very good uh, high internalization and usually they have amphiphilic property means they have hydrophobic and positive charge at the same time. And they can be biodegradable and easily eliminated from the body. And you, most of the time they are composed of natural amino acids. The synthesis is very easy and you can use uh, solid phase peptide synthesis and also functionalize them. The major problem with the linear cell penetrating peptide is toxicity, very short half-life and they are not very selective, okay? So that's caused the problem that if you want to use them for an uh, animal study, they can be eliminated quickly. Some of the reported cell penetrating peptides are uh, TAT, PEP1, uh, polyarginine, and many other peptides that these are usually have a polyarginine residue or hydrophobic uh, tryptophan residue or uh, a mixture of both. So uh, you, you can have arginine or tryptophan. So tryptophan is represented by W and arginine represented by R. So that's why even uh, linear cell penetrating peptide has been around for a long time. They haven't been very successful uh, for drug delivery, and most of the time they are used for transfecting agents in cell-based assay because of the toxicity and also short half-life. So what we are interested in is mostly cyclic cell penetrating peptide. So these are cyclic peptide that compose of hydrophobic and positively charged residue. The reason they, uh, they are more attractive because they have a higher stability toward the proteases, so they can um, um, survive the harsh condition of the uh, um, protease and peptidase that we have our, in our body. And also they have a higher cell permeability compared to the linear counterpart and they exhibit uh, endosomal uh, uptake. So many of the peptides that we have uh, in our uh, uh, body, they, first of all, they will be degraded quickly. But those cell penetrating peptides also, they may undergo endosomal uptake. Endosome is a, a, a way that the peptide will be encapsulated inside the endosomal package and will be trapped inside the cytoplasma and they cannot escape. So we have to find a way to uh, uh, bypass the endosome and uh, um, enhance the endosomal escape if we want to deliver any drug to the cell. So in terms of my research, uh, with this introduction, I want to give you some uh, general uh, research uh, design that I've been involved with. So first of all, uh, we are interested in two amino acids. One is tryptophan, that we call it W, and arginine, that is uh, R group. So arginine is a very positive, a highly positively charged peptide, a basic amino acid. It has a guanidine. Uh, side chain and tryptophan has an indole uh, side chain and is a very hydrophobic amino acid. So we were thinking to design peptide of combination of this uh, that uh, uh, can be used as a, a delivery agent. So first of all, we developed some peptide that are linear that alternate hydrophobic and hydrophilic residue like this uh, structure or we have a hydrophilic uh, uh, residue like arginine attached to two tail of hydrophobic residue. Again, uh, uh, these are linear peptides and we have been using them um, for the cell-based assay. And also uh, many of these uh, deliver the cargo to the cytoplasma and they are very effective. But again, the application of this in the animal study and in vivo will be very challenging. So we became interested in combination of uh, cyclic linear peptide or cyclic cyclic peptide or uh, only cyclic peptide. So you can have a hydrophilic head 
and hydrophobic tear or hydrophobic head and hydrophilic tail, or you can have a cyclic peptide that is fully hydrophilic or one peptide, cyclic peptide that is fully hydrophobic. You can have a head with two legs, uh, uh, could be hydrophilic head and two hydrophobic tail. And you can have hydrophilic and hydrophobic alternate, uh, or you can have all the hydrophobic in one side, all the hydrophilic in one other side. So as you can imagine, there is a huge number of possibility that uh, we can test. And actually we have tested many of these uh, as a drug delivery tool. And I'm not able to cover all of this. Uh, so I'm going to highlight a few class of these compounds. So interestingly, when we have a cyclic peptide like this that have hydrophilic and hydrophobic alternate residue, that like uh, arginine and tryptophan um, um, alternated uh, in the cyclic peptide. This kind of cyclic peptide can act as a drug delivery agent. But if you put all the hydrophilic in one side and all the hydrophobic in another side, uh, you get an antibacterial agent. So the same no uh, number of amino acid, the same amino acid, but the sequence is different. In one, we have all the uh, hydrophilic and hydrophobic in two opposite side, and in one uh, alternate. And uh, one of them can act as a drug delivery agent, one is as an antibacterial agent. So I'm not going to talk about antibacterial agent. This is a huge area of research we've been doing, and we have synthesized hundreds of peptides as antibacterial agent. And we have very good lead compound against a uh, broad spectrum uh, uh, multidrug resistant bacteria. Uh, and we have done some also animal study in infectious animals. So today I'm going to talk more about the drug delivery agent as an anti cancer drug delivery of uh, different compounds. So let me talk about just this simple peptide that have four arginine and four. Tryptophan, and we have used this uh, in many different applications. The story goes back in 2011, we, we realized this peptide actually goes to the nucleus of the cancer cell, and it can deliver different cancer cell, uh, anti-cancer agent to the nucleus. And then we find out that uh, this peptide actually have different other application. You can conjugate it with the different uh, drugs uh, uh, like Dr. Lubicin. It can have a protein tyrosine kinase inhibitory activity. And uh, we already have some idea what's the mechanism of this. Uh, we also conjugate this peptide with different anti cancer drugs, uh, also natural products. Uh, and we have used this peptide for uh, nucleic acid delivery, like sRNA. And recently, we have used similar compound for delivery of CRISPR. And also, many of uh, negatively charged molecules like phosphopeptides that cannot be delivered into the cell. And we realized actually, this peptide actually can uh, generate gold nanoparticles and uh, cap with the gold uh, and be able to uh, deliver different type of drugs. And also, for the delivery of proteins. Uh, we have used uh, some of this uh, uh, derivative of this peptide, and they can be used as a stabilizing agent for protein. So there is multiple application you can have only with one peptide. So what is the process that this peptide is, can be like a kind of magic bullet for different applications? So we realized that this peptide that contain alternate tryptophan and arginine residue it generates a nanoparticle. And as you can see, a small particle are self assembled with each other, generate larger particle, and this large particle even self assemble and generate even larger particle. So this process continues. The way it works that you have a hydrophilic and hydrophobic residue in two opposite sides, and this hydrophobic residue love each other and they want to self assemble with each other and hydrophilic residue that is arginine residue, they want to be exposed to the water molecule. And if you have a drug, uh, you want to encapsulate 
especially if you have a hydrophobic right, you can encapsulate it and this nanoparticle, self-assembled nanoparticle can deliver the hydrophobic drug inside the cell. So it's similar to what you have for Trojan host uh, that uh, you, you can have a hidden uh, hydrophobic molecule inside the host and pass the um, uh, 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 phospholipid bilayer and deliver it inside the cell. So let me tell you a little bit data about this. So this is one anti-HIV drug, uh, uh, lamiudine. So we wanted to see uh, how we discovered this peptide. So we use a cargo molecule that is anti-HIV and attach it to a fluorescent uh, molecule. So we can track it inside the cell. And we designed many different cyclic peptides, uh, not only WR4, but we use different hydrophobic amino acid, hydrophilic amino acid like lysine and phenylalanine or uh, uh, even negatively charged uh, cyclic peptide and so on. So we tested all these compounds with this uh, cargo drug uh, and we physically mixed them. And among all of these, only WR4 and WR5 uh, were able to improve the uptake of this compound. So we eliminated all these compounds and we became interested in uh, tryptophan and arginine uh, cyclic peptide. So this was delivered in the uh, blood cell, leukemia cell, and we have like maybe five or six fold more uptake. And if we do the fluorescence study, uh, if we use only the parent drug that is fluorescence label, we don't see much uptake. But in the presence of WR4 and WR5, we see green fluorescence inside the cell. So this peptide were able to deliver fluorescent label drug intracellularly. And uh, if we look at confocal microscope of another cargo molecule, so we use a fluorescent label phosphopeptide. Phosphopeptide are very cell impermeable. They cannot pass the membrane. So if this is green fluorescent, this is a stain we use for the dyeing the nucleus, DAPI. The Texas said red is used for uh, uh, dyeing the staining the membrane. And if you merge all of this, we don't see any green fluorescence inside the cell. But if in the presence of cyclic peptide, first of all, we see the cells have been uh, incubated with this uh, fluorescence label phosphopeptide, they become green. And then if we merge all of this, we can see the green fluorescence inside the cell. And if we look at uh, a little bit, uh, this is a phosphopeptide that we talking about, the uh, uh, green fluorescence. And uh, I think I have uh, uh, here, uh, if you use only phosphopeptide, you don't see any uh, 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 fluorescence inside the cell. So I was going to show you a video, but uh, let me see. Okay, yeah. So you can see the, if you look at the three-dimensional uh, uh, cell uh, uh, demonstration of confocal microscopy, you don't see any fluorescence inside the cell. So you can see the nucleus that is blue and the membrane that is red. Okay, so. If we incubate the same cell in the presence of cyclic peptide and uh, phosphopeptide, you can easily see the green fluorescence inside the cell. Again, uh, you can look at the three-dimensional confocal microscope, and you can see that the green fluorescence is actually inside the cytoplasma uh, in terms of the phosphopeptide. So this peptide was able to deliver a, a phosphopeptide inside the cell. And phosphopeptides, as I mentioned, are completely cell impermeable. In terms of uh, toxicity, um, you can see that these peptides are quite uh, safe, up to 100 micromolar. So we have a very good cell viability, and we have tested different types of cell lines, including normal cells 
and we don't see much toxicity and uh, uh, cell viability is more than 95% or above that. So another uh, way we wanted to see where the cyclic peptide goes, uh, we can track where the cargo go, what, what about the cyclic peptide? So we, we label the cyclic peptide with the fluorescein. So we have a fluorescein uh, and we incubated different cancer cells with this, including ovarian cancer, colon cancer, and breast cancer. So this is the uh, green, it shows that the uh, uh, labeled peptide. This is the nucleus, DAPI, and if we merge them, everywhere that is green is also blue. So it means that this peptide is actually go to the nucleus of the cell. So it, this is a major application because many of the cell penetrating peptides they trap inside the endosome and they cannot come out of the endosome or they can, uh, may, they may be able to deliver a compound inside the cell, but then if they trap inside the end, endosome, they are not able to deliver them to nucleus or other parts of the cell. So this is a nuclear delivery agent. Actually, we can use it for anti-cancer drugs. So now what we can do with this um, cyclic peptide for anti-cancer drug delivery. So we selected doxorubicin and you are familiar with doxorubicin is a red uh, fluorescein compound and it has uh, anthracycline uh, uh, and it has a glycoside attached to the final ring. So we have tetracyclic compound. Um, this compound has interesting mechanism is uh, is actually uh, intercalate with DNA. Uh, this is one of the mechanisms. It also inhibits the topo isomerase uh, two. Topo isomerase is an enzyme that actually uh, nick the DNA. So when the DNA are coiled, they cannot uh, undergo transcription. So this enzyme has been designed to cut the DNA and uncoil it and then reseal it. So doxorubicin actually uh, and block the resealing of the DNA. So we have a, a kind of a, a cut DNA that cannot undergo uh, transcription. Also, it has another mechanism that uh, cause oxidative stress and it generates uh, that can cause problem in transcription. But then there are a problem with this doxorubicin. This is a very active anti-cancer drugs uh, active against many cancers. The major problem is cardiotoxicity and also uh, kidney toxicity, but also there are many uh, doxorubicin resistant cancer cells that after application, the cancer cells develop resistance. So how we can avoid this problem, cardiotoxicity and doxorubicin resistant bypass? So our thinking was that maybe we can use a cyclic peptide to avoid that. So if you look at the doxorubicin uh, structure, you have a DNA intercalating agent, you have a glycoside uh, and uh, also improve the water solubility. And then you have a topo, uh, uh, topo isomerase to interacting domain. So where we want to attach our peptide. So we thought that many of these functional groups are Im important for interacting with DNA. So we selected this OH group and uh, attach it to a linker and then use a, 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 a conjugation with our peptide. Again, for doxorubicin resistant, uh, one of the major problem because there is a lot of efflux protein. Um, one, one of them is PGP protein. We have also multi-drug resistant associated protein and breast cancer resistant protein. So these, all of these, uh, especially in several cancer like ovarian cancer, uh, we have efflux of the doxorubicin from the cancer cell. So at the beginning it worked, but after a while you see complete lack of activity. Also, as I mentioned, doxorubicin caused the cardiotoxicity. And the major reason as the generation of this uh, quinone that uh, can interact with the uh, uh, oxygen and generate superoxide oxygen and then um, um, radical uh, OH uh, 
that is a fenton reaction that is radical is very active and can cause a lot of problem in cardiac tissue so this is a toxicity uh, uh, issue for heart but then uh, the mechanism as i told you it interacts with the topoisomerase and uh, 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 kills the cancer cell by inhibiting topoisomerase by different mechanisms. So, so we have two major problems, cardiotoxicity and resistance. So we developed this peptide uh, uh, conjugate with doxorubicin through a linker cyclic peptide. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we look at the uptake of this. So if you have doxorubicin in ovarian cancer, it can get into cancer cell and it has fluorescent and you can see. The conjugate also can get into the cancer cell. But after 24 hours, we don't see much retention of doxorubicin alone inside the cancer cell, but the conjugate have much higher retention inside the cancer cell. And so that was the, where the story started. So we started to think about uh, developing hybrid cyclic linear peptide. So we have a head of arginine group in cyclic peptide and poly uh, tryptophan residue and attach it to a linker to a uh, doxorubicin. It can get to ovarian cancer cell, but interestingly, the compound cannot get into the heart cell. So it was very selective against cancer cell. And if we look at the heart cell activity, uh, antiproliferative activity of doxorubicin is here, uh, and it can um, kill the cancer cell. Uh, but then the conjugate, even at 10 micromolar, it doesn't have much uh, 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 toxicity in the cancer cell, in the heart cell. The same thing for kidney cell. The doxorubicin is very toxic against kidney cell, but the conjugate was not very toxic against kidney cell. And we show that in the microscopy data. So if we have a doxorubicin, uh, it can easily go to a uh, heart cell. But when you have the conjugate, we don't see much inside the heart cell. On the other hand, the compounds are very active against cancer cells. So if you have leukemia cell, uh, colon cancer, stomach cancer, so doxorubicin is quite active against cancer cell, but also our conjugate is quite active against cancer cell, um, even at five micromolar after 72 hours. The same thing in the stomach cancer cell, uh, uh, you see doxorubicin is toxic and our conjugate is also toxic. So it's very selective against cancer cell, but not heart cell. And if you look at the fluorescence microscopy of doxorubicin in ovarian cancer compared to the conjugate, you see very high concentration of the conjugate inside the uh, cancer cell, ovarian cancer cell. So if we look at the resistance profile of this compound, if you have free doxorubicin um, tested against white type breast cancer, it has a LC50 uh, of 0.45 micromolar. Our conjugate which shows comparable activity against white type. If you look at the resistance cell, uh, uh, you see fredoxorubicin doesn't have much activity against resistance cell, but the conjugate is significantly more potent than fredoxorubicin against uh, uh, resistance cell. Another resistance cell is a sarcoma that has a efflux uh, pump mechanism. Again, feed activity is not very active and conjugate is active. And we can see this also in this curve. This blue line shows the activity of feed activity and conjugate in a uh, white type. And this solid line, uh, green and red, shows the activity of doxorubicin in the resistance cell. It's not very active. And this uh, comparable uh, counterpart with the uh, uh, conjugate against resistant cells that are much more active compared to doxorubicin. So you can see also this in confocal microscopy. So if you have a free doxorubicin, um, it doesn't get into the resistant cells. So you don't have much uptake. Conjugate not only get to the white type, but it also get into the resistant cells and also get to uh, resistant cells that have uh, 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 if like pump mechanism. So this is a triple negative uh, 
breast cancer cell and this is the uh, sarcoma cell that have a uh, flux pump mechanism. So there are also different me uptake mechanisms. So we can have direct penetration of cell penetrating peptide or you can have endocytosis. And as I told you, endocytosis is a major uh, uptake mechanism, but it has a problem. And we have different type of clathrin mediated endocytosis or micropinocytosis or Kevlar mediated endocytosis. So there are different type of vesicles that cause uh, endocytosis. There are inhibitor of uh, endocytosis mechanism like chloropromazine and chloroquine. I'm sure you all heard about hydroxychloroquine that people thought it can be used for COVID-19 uh, to generate uh, um, endocytosis inhibitor for interaction with uh, a spike uh, protein in uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, but it was not very effective. But nystatin and methyl beta uh, cyclodextrin also inhibit uh, Kevlar mediated uh, endocytosis. So when we use our conjugate and look at the uptake in the presence of the different endocytosis inhibitors, uh, we don't see significant re reduction. Chloropromazine and methyl uh, beta cyclodextrin decrease the cellular uptake. And, but again, uh, this could be a mixed mechanism of uh, uptake, so partial inhibition, but not complete. So we believe that the peptide uh, uh, conjugate uh, get into the cell uh, through the direct uh, translocation. And in the presence of different inhibitors, we still see a significant uptake inside the cell. So uh, the next part, uh, uh, I don't know how much time I have, so I'm trying to uh, uh, be concerned about your time. So. If you have a cyclic peptide like WR5 and increase the size WR6, WR7, WR8, and WR9, make it larger. And when we increase the size of the cyclic peptide, we realize that it's improving the cellular uptake significantly, especially for WR9 and uh, for the delivery of phosphopeptide. So we became interested in WR9 and conjugated with Dr. Rubicin the same um, approach we use for WR5. And the same thing, uh, we saw that this compound is very active against cancer cells, uh, like breast cancer cells, even more potent than doxorubicin. And uh, in different type of breast cancer cells that uh, even at one micromolar, five micromolar was more potent than doxorubicin at the same concentration. And if we look at the uptake uh, of doxorubicin and compare it with the doxorubicin conjugate, we have much higher uptake compared to doxorubicin in breast cancer cell. If we use uh, the resistant cell again, doxorubicin is, doesn't show any antiproliferative activity against dox resistant cell, but our compound was uh, significantly more potent against uh, resistant cell. And again, we can see that the DOX actually doesn't get into the resistance cell, but the conjugate was able to get into the resistance cell. And uh, also, again, we tested this compound in presence of different uh, endocytosis inhibitor, and we didn't see any inhibition of the endocytosis. So that's another advantage. So we have a drug delivery agent that bypassed the uh, endocytosis. We look at the hydrolysis of this conjugate. So uh, at different time period, in the four hour, 12 hour, 24 hours, and 48 hours, it's a slowly converted. This is cell-based assay. Uh, so dox conjugate is converted to the free doxorubicin. And uh, after 48 hours, almost all of the compound has been converted to uh, free doxorubicin. The half-life of this was around 18, 19 hours that is acceptable for in vivo study. So in general, if you want to have an optimal drug delivery agent, you want to have a targeting moiety and we can have an imaging agent and we can encapsulate the therapeutic agent. So we're talking about selectivity to cancer cells. So we need to have some um, targeting moiety that can uh, target cancer cells. So we select the folic acid. Folic acid, um, 
there are a lot of folic acid receptor overexpressed in different cancer cells. And uh, also we attach PEG, polyethylene glycol, to improve the circulation of the peptide and improve the stability. And then we added the imaging agents like fluorescent tag, uh, like alexafluor, to be able to monitor the drug, monitor the, the delivery agent. So this is a peptide we attach to a folate to have targeting. We have a PEG to improve the circulation time. And then we have a tracking agent like CY55. We added uh, this conjugate we injected to animals that have two different type of tumor. On the left-hand side, there are tumor that doesn't express the folic acid receptor. On the right-hand side, this has folic acid receptor uh, expression, HeLa cell. And then we look at the images. Most of the compound actually localized inside the tumor that overexpress folic acid. And we can separate different uh, organs and also different tumor. And you see we have high localization inside the uh, tumor. Also, we wanted to have a drug. So last slide, I showed you a delivery agent with the folic acid uh, and uh, also uh, uh, imaging agent. But we wanted to also have doxorubicin. So we attached doxorubicin, conjugate, uh, PEG and folic acid and also imaging agent. So we have imaging, targeting and drugs and delivery agent, and also we have PEG to improve the stability. So we did some animal study, uh, different time period, and we injected to animals and uh, look at the localization in the uh, xenograph uh, tumor model, and we were able to look see within one hour, uh, most of the compound was inside the tumor and we didn't see much uh, in other organs. There was some in the bladder also. And if we look at this uh, picture, uh, let me show you the video. So if you see this one hour, we see most of the compound inside the tumor and then it uh, released into the bladder. After three hours, most of the compound actually has been eliminated to the bladder and uh, 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 getting uh, really uh, eliminated. So, so we get some selectivity in the tumor uh, within uh, three hour, uh, one hour, and then uh, we have uh, uh, increased uh, elimination from the blood. So in conclusion, we have designed many different cyclic peptide platform containing tryptophan and arginine, uh, and uh, these are uh, self-assembled into the nanostructure and they can be used as molecular transporter. And we have many, many different platforms that uh, haven't been published yet. Uh, hopefully we will see some of this in the next uh, few months. And some of these have been used for delivery of hydrophobic drug, and some of them have also been used for delivery of negatively charged phosphopeptide and sRNA at the same time. So these are some of my uh, postdoc and colleges and some of the students who graduated uh, and many other people, uh, Dr. Rakesh Tiwari, Dr. Dindian Mandal, uh, Sandeep Lohan, and Sagar Muzaffari was involved in the hybrid cyclic peptide, and uh, Paul was involved in many drug conjugates, and Riley was involved in sRNA delivery, and also uh, funding uh, from different agencies, including American Cancer Society, NIH, and many other funding agencies. So with that, uh, I open the floor for the question. Uh, I hope I'm not over time. And uh, so I'd be happy oh, no. to answer any question you may have. Uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, for very, uh, you know, insightful and interesting lecture. So we have some question and answers, uh, questions in the chat box. I'll read them uh, to you for your convenience. Yeah, I can uh, hear you. Okay. So uh, the first question is from Ms. Pariyal Ashraf. She's asking, what if, small, uh, what if some small proteins intrinsically possesses more amount of arginine or trip and tryptophan? So can, we can have these activities or improved drug ability. 
So your comment on it. Okay, so, uh, you know, there are arginine and tryptophan in many uh, protein, but uh, uh, they are not uh, cell permeable because the sequence of this peptide has to be in such a way that uh, uh, they can interact with the membrane. On the other hand, uh, we have used uh, some of this peptide for delivery of protein, including uh, green fluorescence protein. So uh, if you're talking about protein or peptide, if you're talking about peptide, uh, uh, you know, arginine and tryptophan has to be in a specific uh, alternate or a specific format to be able to deliver a different cargo. But protein alone uh, uh, that have arginine and tryptophan, they cannot get into the cell by themselves. So uh, you need always uh, a carrier to do that. Uh, right. Did I understand your question correctly? Yeah, I think that was uh, what she was asking for. She has two more questions. Uh, and both of them are linked probably. One is kindly tell the rough estimates of molecular weight of these peptides. I think she's referring to cyclic peptides. And kindly also make comment on how cyclic protein achieve their 3D conformation if they possess. Okay, the molecular weight of this peptide, usually peptide, they have a molecular weight, amino acids, a molecular weight of 170 to 200. So if we're talking about um, 10 amino acids, we're talking about around 2,000 uh, molecular weight. Uh, uh, this, as you can imagine, these are not a drug-like molecule. There are, you know, if you're thinking about Lipinski rule and uh, low molecular weight less than 500, uh, these are not, these are just for delivery agent. Again, uh, physical chemical property of this compound, uh, uh, they are amphiphilic, they have positive charge and hydrophobic residue, they self-assemble with each other, and they have uh, a different uh, application because we're talking about generating nanoparticles. And nanoparticles, uh, as you know, they use in nanomedicine and uh, they not, don't follow the uh, Lipinski rule. So we're talking about one to uh, 100 nanometer size of this nanoparticle for direct delivery. Right. So we have another question from Dr. Abbas Hassan. He's asking, I understand that uh, the cyclic peptides are compatible with the biological systems but their synthesis is somewhat uh, very difficult. Uh, can we use unnatural or beta amino acid based peptides for the same purpose? However, this, so that their synthesis will be a much easier, your comment on it. Okay, so cyclic peptide, actually, uh, you're right, they can be difficult to synthesize, but the way we synthesize this, uh, so you make the linear peptide and then you, attach the head of the snake to the tail of a snake. So, uh, and if you think about head and tail, they have to find each other. But if you have a very concentrated solution of peptide, the head of one peptide may conjugate with the tail of another linear peptide. So the way to do the cyclization, you have to always use a dilute solution. So the molecule cannot find each other but only can uh, cyclize by, each, each by themselves. In terms of unnatural amino acid and using other type of uh, peptide bond, yes, it is possible. The concept is the same. So you just have to make the linear peptide and cyclize it. But eventually uh, the technical challenge that is you make sure you have a very dilute solution when you do cyclization, so you don't get the uh, dimer and trimer and uh, of the linear peptide, but you only get the uh, uh, cyclic peptide. So the synthesis is based on solid phase synthesis. You make the linear peptide, you cleave it from the resin, and then you cyclize head to tail. But it doesn't matter what type of peptide bond you have, the concept will be the same. Right. Uh, we have another question uh, from Ms. Pariyal Ashraf. She's asking, uh, you mentioned that the cyclic peptides may overcome protease activity. 
but how they evade hcl effect of the stomach i am asking in context uh, if some peptides have been successfully approved as drug we ha- we have concern of their oral deliverance uh, of drug so uh, um, when we say they are more resistant to proteins it doesn't mean they don't degrade but they have a longer half life but there are 50 cyclic peptide drugs on the market already so and you already know some of them like cyclosporine uh, daptomycin vancomycin so there are many cyclic peptide that uh, there are pure cyclic peptide or there are combination uh, with other uh, residue like carbohydrate so it's not like they don't degrade they will be degraded but they have a longer half life and the proteas uh, um, has a hard time to cleave the rigid structure but eventually we have uh, many many different proteas in our body and some of the amino acid in the cyclic peptide are more sensitive to proteas compared to others so it depends on the sequence of the amino acid here we don't have exopeptides and endopeptides because the peptide is cyclic but then uh, uh, eventually we have many other uh, proteins in our body that uh, they will cleave this and they, uh, they will be metabolized and they will be eliminated from the, the body did i answer your question yeah yeah hopefully so and uh, we have uh, so we can take we're running out of uh, short in time so i'll take two short questions uh, one is from mr uh, nadeem altaf if a comparison is made between synthetic cyclic peptides and natural peptides such as mastoperon uh, which compound has less toxicity and more therapeutic value and uh, you mean uh, comparison of cyclic peptide uh, which uh, can you repeat the question Yes, if a comparison is made between synthetic cyclic peptides and natural peptides, oh, such okay. as mast- mastoperon. Okay, synthetic uh, peptide and natural peptide. Natural peptide, sometimes they have uh, unnatural amino acid, actually. They have D-amino acid instead of L-amino acid. We see a lot of uh, cyclic peptides. Uh, separated from marine organism uh, they have uh, unnatural amino acid but uh, those peptides sometimes are very potent and they are much more stable but it uh, experience has shown that they can have very good antibacterial activity and anti-infective activity but uh, sometimes they are not very selective they can also kill the normal cells So we have also used, uh, you know, if you're talking about unnatural amino, uh, natural peptide, cyclic peptide, even we call them natural cyclic peptide. Again, they have many uh, D amino acid and sometimes they have unusual disulfide bound that cause the cyclization and sometimes more than one disi- um, disulfide bound. So, in my view if you synthetic uh, uh, rationally design a synthetic peptide uh, using natural amino acid they uh, are less toxic compared to uh, uh, natural peptide that they have a natural amino acid like the amino acid so uh, and uh, uh, you can control that uh, uh, you know we have also synthesized many cyclic peptides that have a natural amino acid Uh, rather than uh, for example d amino acid we use a different type of uh, hydrophobic unnatural amino acid and we found out that many of them are more toxic compared to natural amino acid uh, so is is a very hard comparison so even you have a natural cyclic peptide sometimes they are much more uh, toxic because the microorganism generate those peptide to defend themselves and kill other organisms so you know that's why even they may have very good anti cancer activity anti bacterial activity and uh, they may be very toxic um thank you very much uh, with this we conclude our question answer session uh, we are running out of time so we cannot take more questions we have professor dr ikbal with us uh, sir if you would like to comment uh, floor is on uh, for you so my only comment is that uh, it was absolutely fascinating uh, 
that we have seen every one of the participant uh, attended the entire session. So over 115 people were there from some 30 countries, uh, truly an international event of immense importance. Uh, we thoroughly enjoyed an extremely high quality science and we have appreciated its relevance with the application in drug discovery and development. So my uh, greetings and gratitude to Professor Dr. Pram for not only conducting high quality science, but also to very effectively communicating uh, the science to everyone uh, from a very diverse group of people uh, from different countries. Thank you very much, Professor Pram. Yeah. Thank you so much from you and also all the people who attended this seminar. You know, thank you so much for coming here. Thank you very much, Professor, for your time. It was an excellent uh, presentation. And uh, I would also like to thank our audience uh, who had interacted and, you know, was very uh, keen uh, towards your lecture. And with this, we come to end of this lecture. Thank you very much again for all, uh, for all of you for joining. Thank you very much.